two in the morning, and that was to do kind of a, a uh, kind of almost a cookbook uh, called Living the Good Life on a Small Island, as really living the good life sustainably on a small planet. And the idea was to have this series of, of uh, kind of community meals and to serve a five-mile dinner, five-mile lunch, and to record the recipes that we do and all the people that went into growing that food and into the making of that food and to use these dinners as a chance to explore the kinds of things we can all do in our own day-to-day -day lives to um, lower our footprint and to realign our way of life with what the planet can supply to us. Uh, we've come to live very offside with Mother Nature over the last 50 years, perhaps over the last 80 years, as we have um, guzzled up every fossil fuel at hand. Um, industrialization really means uh, using fossil fuels to live your life. And it's been a swell ride, and we're all here. I wonder how many people walked here this evening? <laughs> Two hands in the back. Congratulations. <laughs> We have this dinner in a hundred years, everyone will either have walked here or biked here or come here in an electric car. Really, our lives are going to change, love it or not. Um, we are burning off uh, 300, million or 300 million years worth of, uh, of carbon in a matter of 150 years, and poor old Mother Nature just ain't ready for that kind of change that fast. Um, so all that being said, I'll, I'll just get on with this talk. And, the title of the talk is um, The Oil on Your Plate. And um, the, point, the point really is to, to make the case for why everyone should be buying local organic food as much as they possibly can. Um, local organic food is what we all ate up until 100 years ago. It's produced locally. Uh, it does not use uh, much in the way of nitrogen fertilizers. Uh, it does not produce much methane gas and it doesn't use much fossil fuels, so it doesn't put off the kind of greenhouse gases that uh, uh, really uh, account for about 15% of humanity's greenhouse gas production. And switching to buying local organic will make a demand for young people. Um, I see Jeff and Samantha over there just moved to the island to run the, the uh, wonderful new organic farm at Hardscrabble. And it'll make an opportunity for young people like them and our own young people to get back into the business of farming and get back into the business of producing uh, local organic food. Uh, we've got today we've got Shanti McDougall who came here to the island 11 years ago and has been producing a huge amount of wonderful local organic food for us. And she's going to talk about the life and times of an organic. Uh, food producer. I see Christine and Chris out there in the audience who come, and Christine's garden is a fantastic example of, of organic farming here on Main Island that I think is a, a bit of a teaching place for other people interested in organic farming. So the movement is still alive, it's growing, and we all need to shop local organic to encourage people to grow more of it and to build that out. So I want to start, uh, the, the idea really, of Brian's idea was that we get a whole bunch of come to these a whole bunch of people come to these feasts and then we we give them some really depressing news. <laughs> and we, we'd, sugar, we'd sugar the nasty pill. Um, I'm going to launch into the nasty pill right now and just bring the whole thing way, way, way down. And um, uh, you can you can cover your eyes. Uh, I usually cover my eyes when I open this stuff. Um, but you can open your eyes in about 20 minutes. We'll get to the good news. And uh, we're going to have Shanti talk about organic farming. Brian's going to say something about the food value of organic food. And Gary, is Gary here? Yep, Gary. Hey, Gary. Gary's going to talk about shopping for local food and what kind of opportunities we have here on the island and in our communities in Vancouver and Victoria for shopping locally. So I'll just get on with these figures. Um, why eat local organic food? And the answer is to reduce your annual greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, I spent a bunch of time going through this. And if you eat entirely locally, you can reduce your, your direct CO2 emissions by about two tons. Per year? Per year. Uh, <laughs> and that's a lot of, of reduction. Here, here's some of the figures. Um, number of people on our planet is six billion, going up to six and a half billion. It's just terrific. It's a terrifyingly large number of people on this tiny planet. Our total annual CO2 emissions, that's everybody, 
is about 38 billion tons. This is from the UN Climate Change Panel. Uh, the average person's annual CO2 emissions are um, 6.3 tons, um, and the average Canadian's emissions are 18.5 tons. So uh, Canadians have the highest rate of CO2 emissions. All right. <laughs> Let's go for it. And, uh, and that's all we need is to get the planet's annual, uh, the planet's ability to absorb CO2 is eight, um, 8 billion tons. So I wish the figures were reversed. I wish we were producing 8 billion tons and the planet could absorb 38 billion tons and we'd be well in the black, but we're running horribly in the red. Uh, that's the, the worst number is, is that one, the fact that we're basically producing uh, almost five times more CO2 in any given year than the earth and the forest can absorb. And it's that horrifying fact that um, I think puts to rest any, any doubters as to the enormity of the problem. And what's really horrible about, about the problem is that we all can't go home tonight without going out and turning on our cars and helping to produce more CO2. So it's, it's not an easy problem to fix. It's, it's not as easy, for instance, as, as the whole problem of refrigerants and Freon. Back in 1982, with the Montreal Protocols, we simply outlawed the production of Freon and, and switched to other forms of refrigeration, and hardly anyone noticed that, that uh, we just saved the planet and all life forms from being zapped by ultraviolet radiation, but we were able to go on living our lives. This problem won't be solved that easily. We actually have to, each of us, make uh, individual decisions. And that's why the whole sustainable, sustainability movement has to be such a mass effort. The, the figures in terms of atmospheric CO2, Guy Dauncey went over them with us, for those of you that were here in June. Um, we currently have 380 parts per million of CO2. To put that into context, um, the Workers' Compensation Board will not allow a room to be occupied that has more than 500 parts per million of CO2 in it. Um, before we started burning fossil fuels in 1860, uh, there were only 280 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. It's gone up by that much in 100 years. Um, people wonder whether that's due to human, eh, to human beings or whether it's due to volcanoes <laughs> or sunspots. But to, to put that into context, the Earth's CO2 has never been above 280 parts per million in the last one and a half million years. Uh, we evolved as a species in an atmosphere that had far less CO2 in it. And even if we were to stop producing CO2 now, the melting off of glaciers and the polar ice caps would continue for several hundred years. And that melting off in turn makes the Earth absorb more energy, which in turn heats the earth up more, so we're already coasting down the slope. So <laughs> cover your eyes. <laughs> it's, it's such a horrible, I, I, I mentioned this to a group of architects in Vancouver the other day, and, and they all got mad at me. Um, uh, I mean, where we're going, you, you can hardly look at it. I, I feel like perhaps I'm the major D on the Titanic, and it's just, just everyone go and get a glass of wine. <laughs> What do you do? Uh, the, where, where, when do we cross the, the point of no return? Uh, somewhere around 450 to 500 parts per million is the best guess. Uh, some people would say some climate models tend to show that we passed it right now, um, but we're just starting to try and fix the problem, so give us a break, God. Give us a few years to try and change what we're doing.